live good evening everybody i hope you all enjoyed the morning rendezvous with his holiness the dalai lama today evening we have an equally important guest uh, coming live all the way from us dr shanti shanti kaur khalsa uh, brings the ancient techniques of kundalini yoga into modern medicine she has taught kundalini yoga since 1971 and began to teach people with chronic or life threatening illnesses in 1986 during the aids epidemic she now directs the guru ram das center for medicine and humanology founded to bring yoga into healthcare she is a certified cool kundalini yoga therapist a medical family therapist and a kri certified kundalini yoga mentoring lead trainer for level 1 and 2 Dr Khalsa is a charter member of the International Association of Yoga the uh, therapist and served she has served on a team that developed the IAYT educational standards for yoga therapy teacher training she has developed and directs the accredited 1120 hour kundalini yoga therapy professional training in 47 countries her kundalini yoga program for people living with the hiv is featured in the book yoga as medicine by Timothy McCall who is an MD and a groundbreaking work in kundalini yoga therapy is in yoga therapy and integrative medicine where ancient science meets modern medicine so she is the person who can teach us uh, we can learn from her talk about the various methods and means of integrating the traditional therapies with the modern medicine such that these are useful for healthcare education and uh, preventive healthcare thank you uh, dr shanti shanti kaur for making it to our program we look forward the, to hearing from you welcome very grateful to be here and welcome everyone we are as we are going to be speaking today about the, the clinical application how a connection between research and and clinical work uh can serve your clients if you work if you're teaching yoga in a therapeutic way or using yoga therapeutically when i started working teaching in in this field using yoga therapy to help people get well uh i began by teaching these basic techniques you know if you have this condition you use this process and we work with people for recovery but in that process uh it became really clear that the method of the technique that's used for the person to restore their health is necessary but not sufficient in order for people to get well and i'm going to be walking you through now that what that that discovery was the research we did for it and how you can use it in your own work So we were speaking about the what in health psychology is known as self-efficacy. It's the belief that what you do makes a difference. And I'm going to be speaking about how we apply that into clinical practice. When we work yoga with yoga to help people get well, we do three things mainly. We help them feel better, we help them get better, and we help them stay better. Now, our big understanding is that yoga therapy or applying yoga to therapeutic situations is practice based it's sadhana based and it's the practice that the client does or the patient does that the brings the results that helps the person get well because of this you may give this person the most effective method but if they don't actually apply it it doesn't give you the results so what we're going to what i began to discover is that there's a certain psychology that's required in order for people to practice in a way that allows them to return to health this is self efficacy it's the belief that what you do makes a difference and it's the basis for all behavior change if we want someone to uh, apply a particular method they would they have to have the sense that this method is going to make a difference then their action on that method is going to make a difference when you have and you cultivate that belief as a clinician 
then that person is much more likely to follow the protocol of your recommendation. This all started when I was working with people with HIV and I did a doctoral dissertation. And this research was based on this groundbreaking research that was done that correlated the psychological factors with health behavior. This was initiated by Dr. George Solomon and uh, Lydia Temeshak out of uh, UCLA in Los Angeles and by Robert Ramian in Columbia University uh, in New York. The, what they were looking at at that time was what are the, what are the factors that, that help people not get sick or when they do get sick, how come to recover? They were looking at what was called long-term survivors and long-term non-progressors of people with HIV. And what they found, it wasn't their treatment that they had in common. It was a psych certain psychological profile, certain psychological characteristics. And key among them is the belief that what you do makes a difference or self-efficacy. I got very curious about this and I began to think about, well, how can I apply this understanding to the work that I'm doing? So a further investigation with uh, Albert uh, Bandura suggested that perceived self-efficacy and a sense of control over my experience, it affects my emotional, psychological health and that physical health, and that allows me to take, do the health behaviors that I need to do in order to, to restore or prevent, restore my health or prevent illness. This was absolutely groundbreaking to me because I put these two concepts together and I recognized when we can help foster or cultivate self-efficacy in my clients and patients, it had a very profound effect on helping them to change their own health behavior. So my question, my, I got curious, can meditation practice improve self-efficacy? Is that something that can be done? And there was evidence already existing to suggest that this was so, that meditation practice can do this. So I did a study and the purpose of it was to assess the short-term effects of two different kinds of meditation. There's concentrative, where you focus on a particular sound like a mantra or a mental image of bhavana. And there's mindfulness where you allow, you simply notice uh, your thoughts and what your sensations are. So I took these two practices, a specific contemplative or concentrative meditation and a mindfulness practice and studied do they affect, can they improve self-efficacy beliefs? So there were these two meditation techniques. We had, um, it was short term, we actually, and here's the other groundbreaking piece about this. At that time, and even, even these days, meditation research is long-term. At that time, it was like three, five, seven years. And my clients had prognosis of 18 months to two years. They're not gonna do something that takes that long. And currently our, uh, the research is mostly somewhat short-term, eight weeks, 12 weeks. What we wanted to know, especially in a population of people who had a very severe prognosis, if one practice, one time would make a difference in building self-efficacy. Because we know that if people have a positive experience in their practice, they are more likely to continue that practice. So the, the research was done one time, not long term, not eight weeks, one time. And we found that so that in this in this process, we had them do it within subject design, where they practiced uh, one type of meditation, and then they practiced another time, and then we switched it. So we had 78 people who finally, you know, who actually completed the work. We worked with like 107, 78 people um, in, our, in our study. And we did a within subjects design so that we can mitigate any variables uh, between, you know, in the population. And then we took them on a pre and a post on two scales, 
self-efficacy on general and health behavior. And uh, the other was on my ability to create social support, which we know is a key outcome or key benefit to helping people uh, get well. So our conclusions, the short-term practice, meaning one time of either a concentrative or a mindfulness meditation practice, either one, significantly improves social and health behavior self-efficacy. And what I discovered from this research was now, this is so many years later, I found that building self-efficacy, no matter what your health condition, makes a huge difference in people's adherence to the protocol or to the practice so that they can get the effects of getting well of that practice. So this, I now bring this to every single uh, health population I work with. I'm gonna explain a bit about what it is that we did. What was the, the concentrative meditation that we used? This is called Pauri Kriya. And it's a, a meditation technique that involves a combination of mantra movements with the mudra. So we work with um, index to the thumb, middle finger to the thumb, ring finger to the thumb, little finger to the thumb. You might be aware of the research that was done by Dr. Dharma Singh Khalsa on Kirtan Kriya for um, cognitive impairment to prevent and restore uh, memory prevent memory loss and to restore memory and function. So this meditation uses a similar type of movement and the same sound current or the same mantra. So we'll be moving from the index finger to the middle finger, to the ring finger, to the little finger, something like that. We link a sound with the mudra movements. So on the index to the thumb, it's sa, ta, na, ma. The hands will be palm up, but I'm just showing you so you can see the fingers. Sa, ta, na, ma, like that. And the sound is created in a monotone when we chant it out loud. So it's sa, ta, na, ma. There's a specific breath rhythm we use for this concentrative meditation. We're going, we inhale in eight parts, moving the fingers, and we mentally recite sa, ta, na, ma, sa, ta, na, ma. But the, ment the um, recitation is silent because you're going to be breathing in. So that's the inhalation is like this. Now to exhale, we create the sound out loud in a monotone. Sa, ta, na, ma. Sa, ta, na, ma. Your eyes are closed. There's no uh, specific drishti or eye focus for this. And the breath is regulated by the sound. So let's give it, we can do this in, uh, we could take them three minutes to cycle through this so you have a chance to experience it. Let your eyes close down. Allow your spine to be aligned, you're relaxed, you're in Jalunderbund. And bring your breath to a complete exhalation. And we'll begin by inhaling in eight parts. And let the breath go with the sound out loud. Sa, ta, na, ma. Sa, ta, na, ma. Continue. Sa, ta, na, ma. Sa, ta, na, ma. So the fingers move throughout. Sometimes a mantra is silent and sometimes it's allowed. And continue at your own pace. Inhaling in eight parts. Sa.
sa ta na ma sa ta na ma Now, complete your breath cycle wherever you are in it so that you end with the inhalation and gently retain your breath. Together, we'll exhale in one long breath. Inhale in one long breath. Yeah, and exhale with a sigh. You can gently open your eyes, roll your shoulders if you like, or turn your head from side to side and bring yourself present. So if we're looking at clinical practice, we want to make sure that our client has the a strong belief that they can take positive agency in their own health, in their own recovery, and that their practice makes a difference, their practice matters. One of the things that Albert Bandura discovered in his research, Albert Bandura was out of Stanford and his whole body of research is on self-efficacy. He discovered that just the belief that what you do makes a difference, improves your immune system without even necessarily making the change to do something to make a difference. So you can see how powerful self-efficacy beliefs are and how by supporting this in your clients that you can help them improve their health in very effective ways. Blessings. And now let's hear if we have any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, ma'am, for sharing your amazing views on self-efficacy in health recovery. Uh, ma'am, actually, uh, some many people who are wanting you uh, sending greetings to you. Ah, okay. Dr. Kshay is with us. Sir, do you want to ask any question? Sam, do you want to uh, look at the Facebook and see if there are any questions? This was a very different technique that you told, very powerful. I've never experienced this. And you showed ah. some data that has very good results. Uh, are there any randomized clinical trials that have been done to see if it may improve immunity? Have there have been um, any what trials? I'm sorry, say that again, please. Any of the uh, clinical trials that may have been undertaken to see if it can improve uh, uh, heart rate variability uh, or uh, immunity? 
We've not taken the, the research further uh, on, in that regard. Most of my work from that time has been clinical. And I believe that both those questions would be really great areas of research. And uh, do you think there are many takers in the United States for, um, so to give an idea, how many students <laughs> or how many individuals do you train in a month who are receptive and who accept uh, these techniques in their lives? Uh, we are certainly finding that uh, more and more people are willing to do yogic practices not only in the United States, but all, you know, every country that we have trainees. Our work now is to train people to be, who are yoga, who've been trained as yoga teachers to teach therapeutically to become yoga therapists. And there's two things that have happened concurrently. One is you know, through the efforts of, you know, like Shirley Tellis or Satvir saying, there's been an enormous amount of research in the last 25 years on the benefits the medical outcomes of yoga practice. And that research has allowed clinicians to feel confident in trusting to sit to recommend yoga practice to their clients or patients, to send them to someone who has skill and training in, in this. And there, uh, and the other key piece, well, there's three, the other key piece is people want to practice yoga. You know, there's been a huge explosion in the West you know, in the last few years, just uh, because people feel better. And now that they know that they can actually get better and stay better through yoga practice, there's a huge interest in it. And the, the third is that from, um, you know, the medical industry point of view, yoga practice is very inexpensive and it has huge health outcomes. So if we get better outcomes at less cost, there's a, institutions are now very interested in it. In California, there's a major health provider called Kaiser, and they now have part of their, their staff are yoga therapists. This is true for Canada and many, many other teaching hospitals throughout the US. Excellent. So is there a move to engage professors of yoga and professors of meditation in academic institutes such as a University of California or University of California? It's growing. Or any of the universities? It's growing. And, and an, another uh, contributing factor to that growth is the, the professors themselves are now practicing yoga and they have their own experience. Oh my gosh, I can feel, look, look what happens in my being. Not only my physical health, but my mood, my cognition, these are all improved sometimes from the most simple practices of yoga. And they, they are in position, you know, they're associated with the university, they can do, they can conduct research. So the research is expanding uh, considerably in the West now. I'm very grateful for what was um, the value that you basically in India, you have kept the traditions and you have shared them so graciously. And now because of that, the rest of the world can benefit. So I'm grateful to your heritage mm -hmm. and to the work that uh, many, many institutions in India have done throughout the decades to keep this and then to share it. So that we Thank can- Thank you for taking you. it forward and it's a collaborative and a small world and we need to put all the resources together to generate more evidence and awareness about, about its preventive role. Uh, this brings me to a question since in the morning we had His, High, His Holiness Dalai Lama speaking about the value of compassion in our lives. And then we briefly spoke about compassion and its possible role in healthcare, in general health, mental health, spiritual health. Are there any studies done with your techniques to look at that aspect or do you have individual uh, individual relating such um, you know such feelings coming in of compassion tolerance uh, cooperation connectedness uh, resilience that you notice 
We haven't done research, but I can share with you what we have done. Part of our work is to train people, you know, to train um, someone who's, tra who's become a yoga teacher to become a yoga therapist or to teach therapeutically. And one of the key elements is to not just information. You, you, I'm sure you understand that information is not what makes a good clinician. It's your presence and it's your language and your way of being with that person and developing and con uh, cultivating compassion and awareness and presence is a big part of what we do in our training. There is a, a, a sutra or an aphorism that we use that says, for something to be different than it is, it must first be accepted as it is. Meaning if I want to help this person make change or if they want this for themselves, the very first thing is to be present with it, to be accepting of it. And you recognize that is not a simple task. Right? It's, it's challenging, it's quite challenging. But as the clinician yeah. develops this capacity, it's, it smooths the way for their client or their patient. We also include the client and the patient's family and friends, people who are close to that person. Because you can work with someone in your office and then they go home and their environment is where they spend most of their time. So we want to influence and elevate that environment as well. And so we always include the friends and family, whoever is important to that person, so into the, into the practice so that that person has support at home and that there's a, a cultivation of compassion acceptance within that family as well. Sure. Prashant, do you want to look at, thank you for that. Uh, Prashant, do you want to look at the Facebook if there are any pressing questions? Uh, do yes, you have uh, 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 any questions? So ma'am, one question is for you and Facebook. How does self-efficacy or self-reliance is directly related to our belief system, perceptions and inborn qualities? That's a very perceptive question. It actually, my experience has been the, the, that thought frequency, the belief that what you make do makes a difference, permeates everything. It permeates ethics, you know, ethical behavior in, in healthcare. It permeates the person's, uh, when you receive, maybe your medical results are not in the direction you want, but it, you have the belief that what I do makes a difference I'm going to pursue other approaches because my, my mental attitude is I can be effective in my own experience. And when we have that belief, we take action on it. And so even in the middle of say bad news or, you know, and you know, health recovery is not linear. Like I do this, I do this, I get better. It's full of setbacks and circle rounds and come over and new discoveries and all of that. But throughout, if you have consistently the stability of that thought, it affects not only your physical health, your mental well being, but it also affects your actions in a way that's very supportive to feeling better, getting better, and staying better. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Do you have uh, more questions, Prashant? Uh, you yourself want to ask anything about the uh, technique there, or... In... There are many greetings for ma'am, uh, but there is no question, no more question for ma'am. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Shanti, Shanti Kaur for making it into a program. You've been very kind. I know you have a very busy schedule. You're running a big organization. And I also would like to thank Dr. Sadbir Khalsa for um, we had to request him to request you to come to our program. We've been doing this for quite a long time and we wanted to hear from you, the kind of work. We had heard all good things about you. Thank you for bye, sharing bye. wonderful slides and firing our viewers. Uh, please uh, let us reconnect. And on behalf of the Yoga Scholars, PG Amiyar and the India Yoga Association Chandigarh Group, I, I greet you. I thank you for making it happen for us. 
I really thank gonna you so come. much. And I thank appreciate so the very important work that you're doing. I'm very grateful to be present with you today. Namaste. Thank you.